Okay, I included in the slide the sections of the book that you need to read. As you know, they're all over the place. Make I mean, unfortunately, the book is written to separate according to metabolics, to genomics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I fished around the sections that are important for you. Make sure that you look at them. So when we look at catabolism, we have discussed and you learn that microorganisms have two choices. They could ferment or they could respire. And that's going to depend in multiple issues. One of them is going to be their genetics. Other one is going to be the conditions in which they are. So a chemo organotroph can use either process. Think about E. coli. E. coli can ferment if it's in, living in the absence of oxygen, but E. coli can respire if oxygen is present. Not all the microorganisms at, uh, available have both options. Some of them are going to be exclusively respiratory, other ones are going to be exclusively fermentative. So it's going to depend on their genome. Again, when you think about fermentation, in the case of the molecular biology of it, you do not have an electron acceptor to receive the electrons that you have harvested through the catabolism of a molecule. Whereas in respiration, you have an electron acceptor. If you're using oxygen, that is going to be oxygenic respiration. But it could be another molecule who can receive those electrons. And that will be an oxygenic respiration. Now, when we think of fermentation, as I mentioned to you, you do not have a terminal acceptor to receive those electrons. Therefore, you're not going to have uh, an electron transport chain that is going to generate a proton gradient and therefore use oxidative phosphorylation. So in the case of fermentation, the ATP generated is going to come from substrate level phosphorylation. And most of those reactions are happening in the cytoplasm of the organism. You're going to see that fermentation is going to be the mechanism that is going to recycle the NADH generated, for example, through glycolysis to NAD+. And NAD plus then can be used again during glycolysis or whichever it is the pathway that the microorganism is breaking down, for example, glucose, to obtain a pyruvate molecule. However, when we think of respiration, as I mentioned to you, it could happen in the presence or absence of oxygen. So molecular oxygen um, could be an electron acceptor. Another molecule could be an electron acceptor. It's going to be available. So when it is oxygen, that is going to be aerobic respiration. And that, as you know, you have studied this uh, in detail in the mitochondria. It's going to happen in eukaryotes in the mitochondria through the electron transport chain. But in, an aero in anaerobes, um, you have another molecule. For example, nitrate. Nitrate can be used to respire. That is how Pseudomonas respires in the absence of oxygen. You can have sulfur, you can have um, sulfate, whatever it is, you can have another molecule that is going to accept those electrons. And that is an, oxyge uh, an oxygenic or anaerobic respiration. Something other than oxygen is, re is receiving those electrons. Whichever the process is, you're going to have that electron transfer, and that electron transfer happens through the electron transport chain, and you're going to create a proton gradient. That proton gradient is going to be used to generate ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. Now, here is an example of respiration. Here is a chemoorganotroph, which is going to use an electron donor, which is an organic molecule, think glucose. And if the electrons now get harvested in the form of NADH or FADH2, and eventually those electrons land and are given to oxygen to reduce it, that is aerobic respiration. However, you can see that you can have another electron acceptor. It could be an organic molecule. It could be sulfate. It could be nitrate. It could be sulfur. Those are molecules which can also receive electrons. However, that it's going to now be considered anaerobic respiration. And just to review what we ha you had learned in the past, here is the complete pathway of um, respiration and catabolism of glucose. So glucose gets broken down into two pyruvate molecules through glycolysis that is going to generate two NADH molecules and some ATP. Glucose, uh, that pyruvate, excuse me, will be decarboxylated 
to get two carbon dioxides from two pyruvates, you also get two NAD molecules, NADH molecules, excuse me, and that generate an acetyl-CoA molecule, which is now going to go into the citric acid cycle, or the Krebs cycle. In the Krebs cycle, for those two acetyl-CoA uh, molecules which are going in, you're going to completely oxidize them to generate carbon dioxide. Here are the two other, I mean, four other carbon dioxides that are being generated. But you also have six NADH molecules and two FADH2 molecules, as well as eventually two ATP molecules that are generated. So at the end, you have harvested all those electrons. All of that energy from those electrons is harvested in 10 NADH molecules, some from glycolysis, some from the decarboxylation of pyruvate, some from this Krebs cycle, and two FADH molecules exclusively from the Krebs cycle. And those electrons are going to donate, those electron carriers are going to donate those electrons to the electron transport chain, which is represented over here by these little circles at the end. Those electrons are going from high energy electrons to eventually low energy electrons. Oxygen is going to be reduced and into water. And the proton motile force will be created that can generate a total of 34 ATPs in microorganisms, in, in bacteria. And together, if you combine the ATPs that are uh, originated from glycolysis plus the ones that came out from the Krebs cycle and the ones from the oxidative phosphorylation, you get a total of 38 ATP. So again, glucose completely oxidized to carbon dioxide. The electrons are going to be uh, carried, like accepted by NAD plus or FAD. Which glucose is the renal electron donor. That's why this is chemo uh, organotrophic molecule. Now those NADH and FADH2 are going to be, those mobile carriers are going to be able to get those electrons to the electron transport chain, which after passing them across, you get those uh, electrons to oxygen. And eventually that transport of those electrons through the electron transport chain generates a proton gradient that can be used to make ATP. You have already had seen all this material in Bio 110. What I'm going to do now is to take a look at how this looks in a bacteria. Because most of the time we have learned about this in the mitochondria. So to begin with, let's take a quick look here at the citric acid cycle. You have seen this before and I'm just going to give you a really quick overview. So you start with glycolysis that eventually is going to create phosphoenol pyruvate, phosphoenol pyruvate um, donates the uh, phosphate to an ADP to produce ATP and you get your pyruvate molecule. In here at the beginning we have that initial harvesting of some of those electrons and the decarboxylation of pyruvate to generate acetyl-CoA. In the system you're going to have an oxaloacetate molecule that is going to um, is going to be condensed with acetyl-CoA to generate your first molecule of citrate. We have not seen that before. Through a set of reactions, citrate is um, going to be processed through the Krebs cycle into molecules that are going to be oxidized further and further. And you're going to have decarboxylation process generating one CO2 here, another decarboxylation process generated another CO2 there, during those two processes, you also have generation of NADPH. Excuse me, NADH. Um, NADPH could be also generated in one of them, but let's just concentrate about NADH. Eventually, um, you do not have any further decarboxylation, so you're always working with a four carbon molecule from succinate. Um, coming over here into oxaloacetate, you generate more electron carriers. Interesting for me to bring out to you is this little part over here that you didn't learn in Bio 110 is that you can get a pyruvate molecule and combine it with a carbon dioxide to give you an oxaloacetate. So from a three carbon molecule with a CO2, now you can get an oxaloacetate. Or from phosphoenol pyruvate by another mechanism, you can also with, combine it with a CO2, you can get another oxaloacetate. So we in Bio 110 we skip those steps, but just know that multiple steps could be used. 
At the end, what I want you to remember is that through oxygenic respiration and the Krebs cycle, for example, from, from uh, glycolysis, you can get from two pyruvates, two GTPs that eventually can go through substrate level phosphorylation converting to ATP. You can get NADH, eight of them, and you can get two FADH2s. Now, depending on the molecule that is being oxidized, you can come in the sense through acetyl-CoA. Think about what we discussed about beta oxidation. When you take a fatty acid, you break it down into acetyl-CoA. This is where it comes from to give energy. Okay? So now, that is a tiny review of what is happening during respiration with glucose. What we're going to see is that respiration happens in multiple different ways by the organism. You can have aerobic electron transport chains in which oxygen will be the ultimate electron acceptor. You can have anaerobic electron transport chain where another molecule other than oxygen is the electron acceptor. So there is tremendous diversity among respirers. All is going to depend on what is the molecule that is going to receive those electrons at the end. All of them, however, share the fact that the electron transport chain it's coupled in oxidation and reduction reactions. And we're going to see that those electron transport change reactions are going to create that proton gradient, and that proton gradient is going to be used to power the ATP synthase to generate ATP. As you see, that is completely different from fermentation. Generation of ATP in fermentation is from substrate level phosphorylation. Generation of ATP in respiration is from ATP synthesis and oxidative, excuse me, and oxidative phosphorylation. Now, when we think about the electron transport chain, just as a tiny review, let me bring you some of the components that you're going to see. As you remember, all these complexes are going to be embedded in membranes. Think of the mitochondria and how the mitochondria have beautiful cristae inside that increases the surface area where the electron transport chain reactions are happening. Think of the fact that you have fable proteins. You're going to have metal containing proteins, for example, the iron sulfur proteins. You're going to have soluble electron carriers that are moving within the membrane, like in this case, the quinones. And in here, you have an example that's going to be ubiquinones in aerobes, but we have menaquinones in anaerobes, so they're a little bit different. And in archaea, we have the calderia quinone, because some of these archaea are living in hot environments. Caldero means from hot. Um, you can find it in archaea. Some of you already had seen this in the lab, that the cytochromes are going to be different. We always have gone with cytochrome C, because that is the one found in eukaryotes. But... Pseudomonas have cytochrome C, but E. coli has cytochrome O. So you're going to see that the cytochromes are going to be different. So you can, we can distinguish the microorganism by the type of cytochromes that they're using. So it is not always cytochrome C. Yes? Um, is there like one particular thing about the cytochromes that would make them different, like the difference between cytochrome C and B? The structure. Or, um, so like the structure. Yes. Okay, so like just the complete structure, not like one particular... The structure of a particular moiety, which... I am not going to show really in detail to give you the differences. Because at this point, what I want you to remember is that all the cytochromes are also mobile carriers of electrons between one electron transport complex to another. Okay. So again, just to emphasize this well, because I don't want you to think, I have seen students who think that anox, anaerobic respiration is fermentation. And some books use that Confusing nomenclature. When we're talking respiration, it's always about electron transport chains. It's just who receives that electron. If it's oxygen, it is aerobic. If it is another molecule other than oxygen, it's anaerobic. All right? So here in this image from the old book, we don't have this image in the new book, I have the molecules that are present in the electron transport chain according to the redox potential. Remember from Bio 110 that the redox potential, it is the capacity of a molecule to either give or donate electrons. 
what you can see here is that you can have, I'm going to put a substrate there, but let's start with NADH, which is the one most likely donating your electrons. Notice that the next molecule receiving the electron is flavo, it's a flavoprotein, protein, and it has a less, and it has a slightly more positive electron uh, reduction potential than the NADH. The one that comes after that is an iron sulfur protein. The color over here is uh, indicating that this is happening in one complex. That molecule of iron sulfur has a slightly more positive redox potential than the flavor protein. Remember what we discussed in bio 110, that the redox potential it's giving you, the more negative the molecule, the better it is at giving electrons to another. So you compare two molecules to one another, the one with the more negative redox potential donates electrons to the other one that has a more positive redox potential. And this ensures that the electron transfer among the molecules is happening unidirectional. Because once that iron sulfur protein receives those electrons, it cannot really give it back to the flavor protein because it has a more negative redox potential. It has to give it down to the quinone. So when we think about this, your electron donors have a higher tendency to give electrons. Each molecule in a redox reaction is going to be oxidized and reduced. When it is reduced, it now becomes a better electron donor than its oxidized version, which can accept them. So we always can represent these molecules as redox pairs. So the flavoprotein protein reduced gives electrons better than the flavoprotein protein oxidized. Know that these are going to be a stepwise release of energy from a molecule with a high redox potential than the other one that has a lower redox potential, more positive. Even. So what we're going to see is that the molecules, as they're going down the electron transport chain, have increasing more positive redox potential, and therefore they are better electron acceptors. That is why from the software B glucose with a high redox potential than NAD plus, eventually NAD plus is able to get those electrons after the oxidation of glucose. Now NAD plus, NADH, excuse me, is able to give those electrons down to let's say flavoprotein, because flavoprotein has a more positive redox potential than NADH. So you have it as a chain reaction with more in, with increasingly positive redox potential. Now, in this figure from the book, what we are looking at here in the bottom part, it's the redox potential of all the four complexes that are involved in the oxygenic respiration process. And remember, in respirers, and in mitochondria, we're going to have four complexes here, complex one, complex two, it's the one in which, uh, actually, let me go back. Here, complex one, it's the one in which NADH donates its electrons. And there is where the flavor protein is going to be present. And here you can see the iron sulfur proteins. After that, you have the quinone pool coming in. Electrons can also come in through complex two. And complex two is the part in which succinate donate uh, electrons um, to be reduced to fumarate. And you see, remember that, that is the part of the citric acid cycle. This is the only enzyme of the citric acid cycle that is membrane bound. But that is the process in which FADA, FAD can accept those electrons to become FADH2. And now FADH2 can pass those electrons to the quinone pool. So the electrons are coming in through two different complexes. Complex 1 from NADH and complex 2 via FAD and FADH. FADH2, excuse me. Eventually, from either complex 1 or complex 2, the electrons enter the quinone pool. And the quinone pool is able to donate the electron to complex 3. Here you have the BH complex and cytochrome C1. Now, from that complex 3, electrons are passed through the cytochrome, in this case cytochrome C, to the last complex, complex 4. 
And in complex 4, you have the reduction of oxygen into water. You already know the names of this complex, so I'm not going to go in detail. I'm just going for now. Just keep them as complex 1, 2, 3, and 4. But remember that as those electrons are passing through, you're going to have the movement of protons across the membrane by the complex. Complex 1 passes four protons across. Through the quinone pool and complex 2, you have four protons being passed across from what we consider to be complex 3, but it's related to the quinones. So complex 3 passes, quote-unquote, four protons also to the outside. And the last complex passes two protons to the outside. So a total of 10 protons are passed from one NADH molecule. If we are coming from uh, FADH2, now we have the total passage of six protons. So if we pass four protons plus four protons from two, that is 10, that gives me from one NADH molecule, enough protons to have an entire turn in the ATP synthase to produce 3 ATP. That's why we say that from one NADH molecule, you get 3 ATP. Since we only have six protons coming through from an FADH2 giving electrons, we get only two ATP from the ATP synthase, so two-thirds of a turn. Therefore, you get more energy from an NADH passing electrons than from an FADH2 passing electrons. We're going to see that later. All right? Any questions about this particular portion? Again, this is review from Bio 110. Does it seem so? Now, just to tie this all up, remember that the process of chemoosmosis, which is the generation of a proton gradient, it's going to be used to generate ATP. So here in this image, what we have is that big circle represent the entire electron transport chain system, which is going to generate protons. And now you have a really high concentration of proton in the outside. So therefore, you have a concentration portion to your electron, to your proton gradient, excuse me. You also have the um, chem the electric gradient across the membrane. More protons in this side tend to have a positive charge to that side of the membrane, therefore leaving negative charges to the inside of the membrane. So the combination of that chemical gradient of protons, which are high in high concentration in the outside, they now want to come down their concentration gradient to the inside. The combination of the fact that you have positive charges in the outside and negative charges in the inside, the positive charges repel the protons, the negative charges are going to attract those protons. Those two create that electrochemical gradient of protons, which is also known as the proton motile force, and therefore they pass to the ATP synthase and make that enzyme turn, and from every one-third of a turn, you generate one ATP. A full turn of the ATP synthase generates three ATPs. So that is the chemosmotic process. And as you remember, here is a picture from the ATP synthase. It's a multi-protein complex. It has the F1 portion, which is outside. That is the portion where ATP is hydrolyzed or ATP is created because the enzyme goes both ways. And the F0 portion is the channel where the turbine portion where three protons are going to pass through to turn it. And that turning is going to make sure that the lollipop portion, which is the F1, turns around. So you have potential energy turned into kinetic energy. That kinetic energy can now be stored as chemical energy. So... It's using a similar mechanism as the flagellum. We discussed that how protons go through the turbine of the flagellum to make it turn. So they have a similar proton. And again, this is just a little tidbit of information that it was discovered by Paul Boyer in 19... And that gave him the, uh, the Nobel Prize in 1997. This is from UCLA. So go Bruins. Okay.
Thank you for the joke and laugh. Now, just to go over here, remember, if we combine the ATP production from glycolysis and the electron transport chain and um, the citric acid cycle, in a microorganism that is bacterial, we get 38 ATPs. That is different from an eukaryote, where you get close to 30 to 32. You remember having this conversation with Reed in Bio 110? Yes, you. <laughs> you said, no, I learned for my MCAT that it's not 38. It's like, it's a different organism. And when we discuss, uh, actually you prompted me to research this more closely, is the fact that the NADH generated in the cytoplasm don't cross into the mitochondria. The energy is passed and you lose some of that energy and therefore you have less ATP created that way. In mitochondria. From glycolysis. It doesn't cross inside the mitochondria directly. It's passed by proton, by an electron uh, transport that generates another molecule that is now FADH, which is less ATP-like. Exactly, and therefore less protons. That's why we have less ATP. So I remember having that discussion with Reed in Bio 110 in that other classroom, and that prompted me to investigate it more closely. So questioning me, like Reed did in that particular day, he's there, yeah, I remember, uh, makes me learn things that I can then bring that to you. But again, when we think of an E. coli, let's read it aloud for the moment. When we think about an E. coli, because everything is happening in close proximity, you do not have that transfer. The NADH of glycolysis is directly available in the cytoplasm. Therefore, it could be used in the, in the electron transport chain immediately. So now, from glycolysis, from that glucose into pyruvate, you get two NADH molecules. Those will donate the electrons to complex one. You also get two ATPs that are going to be generated net. Because remember, in glycolysis, you're going to use two ATPs in the preparatory steps, and you harvest four. So the net gain of ATP is only two. So from substrate level phosphorylation, you're going to get two ATPs. Now, those NADHs, when they go into oxidative phosphorylation, they're going to generate, each of them, three ATP. So you got six total. So that's why you got that eight. Now you go from pyruvate. Remember, the pyruvate decarboxylation generates an NADH as well. So you're going to have two pyruvates, that's going to give you two NADHs. And when you go into the entire citric acid cycle, you're going to have also the NADHs generated per pyruvate. It's going to be three from the citric acid cycle and one from that decarboxylation. So from every pyruvate, you get four. You can also get one FADH2, and you get a GTP. Now, GTP is going to be converted to ATP through substrate level phosphorylation. That's why in some books they show ATP being generated immediately. But since you have per pyruvate, you have four NADHs, so that's 12 ATP, one FADH2, that's two ATP. So you get a total of 14 ATP, one extra, that's 15. See, so you have two pyruvates, that is 30 ATP. So 30 ATP plus eight ATP, that's a total of 38 ATPs per glucose. Okay? All right. Now, let's look at oxy, uh, uh, respiration from the perspective of now the anaerobic molecules that are going to accept electrons. So as we say, either from an organic compound donating electrons, you can have those electrons be received either to an oxygen, as in aerobic respiration, or to another molecule that is going to consist of anaerobic respiration. But the thing is, is that you also have electron donors which are not organic. Hydrogen can donate electrons. Ammonia can donate electrons. We already had studied some of those pathways um, 
nitrite can donate electrons. So now who receives the electrons? It's going to either make it oxygenic, like in the case of the nitrification, where ammonia donates electrons, the electrons end up in oxygen. So that is aerobic respiration. But the molecule donating the electron is ammonia, it's not glucose. Then nitrite donating electrons eventually go to oxygen. That is also oxygenic respiration. But what you're going to see is that the electron acceptor could be another molecule. It could be a nitrate molecule. It could be sulfur. So that is going to make that respiration anaerobic. So you already had seen two cases in which the electron donor is an inorganic molecule. Think of nitrification. Nitrification is a respiratory reaction because it's going to an electron transport chain that creates a proton gradient, and that proton gradient is used to generate ATP. So this is how the electrons get tied up together. You were thinking about it as nitrification, but nitrification is respiration, and it's oxygenic. All right? Now, let's take again a look at the electron tower. And here in this electron tower, what I'm showing you are all the potential molecules that can receive electrons. Here we have hydrogen being an electron donor. Here's NADH. Here's acetate, sulfide, sulfur, fumarate, of course, the quinone, iron. All of them are here, and they are organized according to the redox potential. So you can see that many molecules can donate or accept those electrons. Oxygen is at the very bottom, with the most electropositive redox potential. It's about, you can see that in parentheses, the molecules, it tells you, like if you look at oxygen right here, in parentheses, it says plus 0 0.882 volts. And it also tells you how many electrons are accepted. That's going to be important. So we're going to see that in a moment. So you can see that hydrogen over here has a redox potential of minus 0 0.42 volts, and it can donate two electrons. On the other hand, iron plus three can receive electrons from, or iron plus two can donate electrons. It can only donate one electron at pH seven, and the redox potential is 0 0.2 positive. So this is giving you a lot of information that you need to remember. So remember, oxygen is the strongest electron acceptor that we have because of the redox potential that it has. Now let's take this back to what you learned in Bio 110, that the distance between the electron donor and the electron acceptor is going to give you the change in redox potential. That is delta E. And you can use the change in redox potential to calculate the free energy of the reaction as delta G. And remember that in Bio 110, they give you that silly formula of delta G equals minus N times 0 0.023 without any units. Let me just show you the, the, re, the actual formula, which is delta G naught is going to be equal to the minus N F, which is the Faraday constant, now multiply by the change in redox potential. And the Faraday constant can be given to you in multiple different units. I am choosing to give you the units here in joules divided by volts over mole. Because the book that we're using goes in kilojoules to look at the energy. The one in Bio 110 was using at kilocalories over mole. That was, that's why it was giving you a different number. So now, remember, look at an electron donor, look at the redox potential of that electron donor, find the electron acceptor that is going to be used. And here I circle NADH as the redox, as the electron donor, and I have put oxygen as the electron acceptor. So you can calculate the redox potential by subtracting the redox potential of the donor over the minus the redox electron redox potential, excuse me, of the acceptor. So let's look at that. Here, then you will have to have the acceptor is going to be oxygen. That will be 0 0.82, which is positive, minus the redox potential of NADH, which is minus 0 0.32. So the change in redox potential is going to be a positive 1.14 volts. Yes. 
Oops, excuse me. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I have I copy pasted this to make it pretty and I made a mistake. So yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So it's acceptor minus donor. Acceptor minus donor. So that's why it goes from 0.82 volt minus minus 0.32, which is 1.14 volts. So acceptor minus donor. Now, when you plug this into the equation, if you're thinking about NADH accepting elect giving electrons to oxygen, here it's the minus 82 volt minus minus 0 0.32 volts. That is plus 1.14 volts. That is the change in relax potential. Plug that into the equation that, as you know, is donating two electrons and oxygen is accepting two electrons. So that is going to be N. It's going to be 2. So you have minus 2 multiplied by the Faraday constant, which in this case is 96,500 joules divided over volts over mole times 1.14 volts. At the end, that gives you a delta G of minus 220.02 kilojoules, because I have to convert it into kilojoules, otherwise it would be a huge number, kilojoules per mole. And you can look that into any book, and that is the issue. So you can use this redox table here to calculate the energy generated by the electron donation of one electron to another. And when you look at it, the more positive of the change in redox potential, the greater the amount of energy because you get a more negative delta G. This is why we're going to see that when we look at the same electron tower with the electron acceptors that are other than oxygen, you get a lot less energy because the change in redox potential is going to be a lot smaller. And when you put, for example, from NADH, which is minus, 30, minus 0 0.32, and you give it to iron, which is plus 2, for example, you're going to only get like a 0 0.5, 0.54, positive. Compare that to the 1.14 volt, that the, like, the uh, change of redox potential from NADH to oxygen. So if NADH is giving electrons here to iron, let's go back to the iron picture, here it is, it's plus 2. So you're basically having 0 0.2 minus 0 minus minus 0 0.32, which is basically plus 0.52. Very small redox potential. You plug it into the equation and you're going to have a very low, though negative, delta G. So less ATP is going to be generated. So always remember that the thing is that the change in relax potential, the more positive it is, the greater the amount of energy you get. And you can calculate that anyway. So be ready to be able to remember how to calculate this stuff. You did that already in Bio 110. Or you should have done it in Bio 110. At least if you took the class with me, we did it. Mm -hmm. Now, just so you can see, a lot of funky molecules can be electron acceptors. You can have um, fumarate become an electron acceptor, arsenate, iron, selenite, manganese. Depending on the microorganism, they will have the enzymes and the system to allow other electron acceptors. And here in this table, it tells you again the delta, I mean, it tells you the real potential, so you can see it. Look at chloride. That's why it's a super oxidizing agent. That's why we use it in bleach. It's that ion. It's a plus one. That is fairly beefy. That's better than oxygen. Now, when we look at some of these energies uh, from this redox potential, we're going to look, here's in this table, is giving you the reaction of these chemolithotrophic reactions. You can look at it, and for example, in the nitrifying bacteria, you already see that in the nitrogen lecture, where ammonia is going to donate the electrons, oxygen is going to get it, and here you can see that you get a delta G of minus 274.7 kilojoules per reaction. That's a beefy reaction to get energy 
especially when the ATP uh, delta G is what? 39 kilojoules. So it's fairly usable to make ATP by this reaction. Other ones are modest, like the ferrous iron. That's almost not getting it to make ATP, but it does. I forgot to tell you the number. As the entire reaction, it becomes minus 65. Actually, let me put it over here. That's the better number to look at. Okay? So let's take a look at some of this respiratory reaction. I've chosen two of them. Supposed, I mean, there's a lot of those respiratory reactions. We can spend an entire semester learning about respiration in microorganisms and going deep into the biochemistry. But what I decided to do is to choose two. Methanogenesis, because you already had seen how methanogenesis is important in fermentation. The respiration of using uh, hydrogen as the electron donor. And we're going to use, see how the methanogens are going to take the CO2 as an electron acceptor and now make methane. And that is going to require hydrogen. And the other one, it's the respiration of sulfur. And here, the sulfur bacteria are going to use sulfate, SO4 minus 2, as the final electron acceptor. So we're going to take a look into that. So here in this image, what you have is the beautiful, the beautiful, the beautiful sulfur redox cycle. Like I said, the metabolic chapter is going to throw cycles like you at all times and you're going to get overwhelmed by this. Don't. Take it a cycle and you can see that sulfide can become sulfur and sulfur can, uh, hydrogen sulfide over here can then eventually become sulfate. And that can happen in either oxygenic or anoxygenic reactions. You can break it like that. But it could happen either in an assimilatory process where that sulfur eventually become a thiol group and that thiol group can be put into amino acids. Just like the ammonia can become an amine group into an amino acid. Here now that thiol group can eventually be brought into an amino acid. Think methionine. Think cysteine. You're bringing that up. Or it could be put dissimilatory where it could be secreted to the environment. So we're going to look into that. Now, when we look at dissimilative sulfur reducers, all except archaeoglobulus are bacteria. And if you look at it, most of them are delta proteobacteria. So here in this little phylogenetic tree, it's looking at a little phylogenetic tree based on who is using sulfate. And basically, as a complete oxidizer or incomplete oxidizer, the complete oxidizer have the red dot, the incomplete oxidizers are the blue dot. Yes, Reed? It is releasing it. When we talk dissimilative, it releases it to the environment. So it releases sulfate? For example. We're going to show you that in two different ways. As we were talking in office hours today, when you decarb deaminate a amino acid and you produce ammonia and it goes to the environment, that is dissimilative. Later, the plant can take that nitrate and bring it into the biological system as an assimilative mechanism. So the same thing with sulfur. It can be released, whatever the compound can be released to the environment as a byproduct, or it can be brought inside a molecule to make an amino acid, for example. Now, several of these organic sulfate molecules can accept electron. Sulfate and sulfide are two of them. And this table, what is showing you is the uh, oxidation state of the sulfur ion in some of these compounds. <clears throat> the bottom part is showing you some of the electron donors that can be involved into these reactions. Look, there's hydrogen again. There's acetate. Some of the, some of the molecules that are coming out of fermentation. Lactate, prior, uh, propionate, butyrate. So some of the molecules that are being generated by fermenters can be used by other sulfur respirers to now respire. So these fermentation reactions could be used to respire anaerobically by certain organisms, all right? So take a look at this. So if NADH gives the electron, calculate who the electron acceptor is going to be, use that equation that we looked at it, minus N times the Faraday constant and the change in redox reaction, and you can see how much energy it is generated in kilojoules. And how much energy, compare that to the amount of energy needed to make an ATP molecule. 
you should be, all, be able to do that by this level. Now, as I mentioned, this, let's, let's just reiterate that an assimilative process is going to take that molecule and bring it into the biological system. That could be nitrite being brought into the system by the plant. It could be sulfate to create a thiol group. It could be carbon during carbon uh, assimilation. So the cell uses that. So most eukaryotes can do some level of assimilation. We talk about plants assimilating, for example, nitrate. Think about the hydroponic system. Some, the plants definitely are assimilating carbon dioxide by the Calvin cycle. So that is assimilative. They're bringing that molecule into the biological system. Dissimilative is when that compound is released as waste. You diss it. I'm not going to talk to you about any more compound. Get away from me. You diss that compound into the environment. Therefore, that compound can be used by some other organism. We have a dissimilative relationship with CO2. We don't incorporate CO2 into our system. We breathe it out through respiration. So CO2 is dissimilated outside. When a bacteria breaks down an amino acid and releases ammonia, that is dissimilative. Okay? So let me introduce you now to bring this back into sulfur respiration because sulfur respiration is going to happen both assimilative or dissimilative. But in order for that to happen, it uses two special nucleotides. The first nucleotide is APS, adenosine 5-phosphosulfate. Look, this is just like an ATP molecule, but instead of having a phosphate at the second position, now it has a sulfate there. So APS looks like an ADP, except that instead of having two phosphates, the second phosphate has been changed for a sulfate molecule. The other molecule that is going to be used is PAPS, phosphoadenosine 5-phosphosulfate. And PAPS, instead of having the hydroxyl group in the ribose here, now you have put a phosphate right there. So during the simulative respiration, you're going to have an adenosine monophosphate that is going to be converted into adenosine 5-phosphosulfate, so APS. And during the simulative, in a simulative, excuse me, you're going to now generate a PAPS molecule from there. Let's look at this reaction here. So let's begin by having the electrons over here in sulfate. Sulfate is here in the upper area. You have an enzyme that is going to take ATP, in this case, and is going to get a pyrophosphate out, basically generating AMP. That AMP now is going to welcome that sulfate to create APS. So the AMP got a sulfate where the second phosphate would have been. Now you have APS. This. If we now go into the dissimilar pathway, let's go down the image, you have an enzyme called APS reductase, which is going to get electrons, and now the AMP gets taken out, and you have reduced sulfate to sulfite. Now sulfite, with a set, set of reactions, will take six electrons by the enzyme sulfide reductase, and that is going to give you sulfide. Sulfide now is excreted outside. Not used anymore. Yes, Reed. Okay, so what is the second pathway like? I'm going to go there in a second. Oh. I was taking the first pathway because that is the dissimilative pathway. Oh, so that's no. Assimilative. Okay. So there, from the sulfate, by the enzyme ATP sulfurylase, you're going to create APS. Here you have now the electron transfer to get rid of that AMP with the APS reductase, you now get sulfite. Sulfite gets further reduced by sulfite reductase into sulfide. Sulfide gets out of the cell. Dissimilative. But not, not, not all microorganisms have dissimilative respiration. Some of them are going to have a similar respiration. But they all start by sulfur. 
So you're going to take your sulfur, you're going to create APS, but now a second enzyme is going to phosphorylate that APS, that is the APS kinase, and now you're going to generate PAPS, the phosphoadenosine phosphosulfate. Remember that phosphate has been played in where the hydroxyl group in the sugar was. Now, NADPH is going to donate electrons. PAPS gets out. You have now the reduction into sulfite. Another sulfide reductase gets electrons into sulfide, and sulfide can now be incorporated into cysteine, methionine, or any of the other sulfide-containing molecules that the cell has. So you brought it back in assimilatively. So you have the two ways in which sulfur can be brought in. Dissimilative and assimilative. You require the intermediate phosphoadenosite phosphosulfate in the assimilative pathway. You do not have that intermediate in the dissimilative pathway. All right? So to this level is what you have to remember the sulfate reactions. Just like it's shown here in this, this is what the book, and I will be expecting you to understand these reactions. So therefore, the organism, when it's about to respire, here you have the electron transport of that. So here we can start, in this particular reaction, lactate, which is a product of a fermentation from some kind of bacteria, the lactic fermenters, has created lactate and is going to give those electrons to the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase to generate pyruvate. Now pyruvate can go into the process that we went already, already and discussed to create acetate to ferrodoxin. And here you can create now, because one of those intermediate is going to be acetyl phosphate, now you can create ATP to substrate level phosphorylation and a CO2 molecule there. This is very similar to what we were looking in fermentation. However, you now have hydrogen gas from the decarboxylation, the dehydrogenation, excuse me, of lactate. So now the hydrogen gas can go into a hydrogenase. That is going to break the hydrogen gas and take the electrons from the hydrogenase, generating protons they are going to be passed to an iron sulfur protein, which can eventually pass it to a cytochrome protein. That electrons now go into another enzyme that can, is another electron transport chain over here. And eventually, here you have an iron sulfur protein. Here is where you have the reduction of sulfate. So sulfate is going to get those electrons from the iron sulfate proton to generate, in this case, hydrogen sulfide. The, elect the proton gradient is generated here. And that proton gradient can now be used to generate ATP. Therefore, you have a respiratory reaction. Anaerobic respiration, because the electron acceptor is going to be, in this case, a derivative of sulfur. Sulfate, excuse me via APS. Any questions about this part? All right. So make sure that you read the part of the chapter, look at this, and understand the system of how sulfate reduction leads to a proton motile force that can now be used to generate ATP. Because we're going to look at methanogenesis now. No, another respiratory reaction happening anaerobically. Think the gut. We discussed it in the paper in class that it's, you have a, in the case of the people who are obese, they had a lot of methanogens, which are you, um, reducing hydrogen. So now methanogenesis can happen in either chemoheterotrophic or chemoautotrophic. So hydrogen can be the source of energy electron acceptor. That's the one that we discussed in class. But it could also be acetate. And this table that I got from an article, and I forgot to cite it, so I apologize. This table, it's showing you all the microorganisms that are able to do methanogenesis, and it tells you which is the donor and what is needed. So here are the substrates used in the reaction on the right. So to get a look at that and be familiar with them. 
as you know, all of them are archaea. There's not a single bacteria that can do methanogenesis. Where can we find them? In a very large amount of different uh, environments. Of course, we talk about the human gut, but it could, they're also going to be found in the gut of other ruminants. We're going to look at ruminants later. Or in the gut of cecum founders like horses and rabbits. They are having symbiotic relationship with protozoa. And those protozoa are found in the gut of termites. And therefore, when the termite eats wood, the protozoans are going to help them digest the cellulose and generate methane. So it could be fine also in environments like rice paddies or landfills, etc., etc. Anywhere that you have fermentation and the fermentation produces hydrogen, they will be found. Now, in order for methanogenesis to happen, we're going to see the involvement of, I believe, seven different coenzymes involved. Here is methanofurin. Look at the very large structure of it. You don't have to memorize it. What I want to point out to you first is that this coenzymes that are in the upper left hand in this, they're all going to be carriers of carbon. The carbon from CO2 is going to be carried directly by one of those coenzymes as it is converted into methane. So you have methanofurin and you have methanopterin, excuse me, that's the second one. You also have the coenzyme M, which has a thiol group in there, and you have the coenzyme F340 right there, which as you see, has a nickel molecule on the inside. It looks like a heme. It is a heme structure, no iron in the middle, but a nickel molecule. Now, the other coenzymes here in the bottom are the electron donors in the reaction. So you're going to have uh, coenzyme F420 uh, here in the bottom and coenzyme B. So this is the scary part about this reaction. Here is respiration by methanogenesis. And what I want you to follow is the fate of the carbon dioxide, which is here in green. And what's going to happen to it if it receives the electrons during the, being the ultimate electron acceptor of the reaction. So the electrons, I put them here, it's coming from a ferrodoxin, which is reduced. That ferrodoxin could receive those electrons here from hydrogen. So let's just start over here by having the ferrodoxin reduced, which is going to donate the electrons here to carbon dioxide. But here, the methanofurin, it's going to now have a complex with the CO2 to create a formyl group in that carbon. So it went from a CO2 into a formyl group attached to the methanofurin. So now you have free CO2 attached to that very large methanofurin molecule you're now going to have the reduction of the formula group to a methylene. But to have that first, you have to pass along that formula group from the methanofurin to the methanopterin. So you are exchanging that carbon coenzyme. So now, here in yellow, it's the methanofurin, and now that formula group here, here's the methanofurin going out. I added that because the book doesn't have it. And here, methanopterin comes in and picks it up. So you have passed the formyl group from methanofurin now to methanopterin. Methanopterin is now going to accept electrons. Well, the formyl group is going to accept electrons. Those electrons are going to be given by the F420, which is going to be reduced by getting hydrogen atom electrons. So here is where the hydrogen comes into play again. So here, the oxidized um, F420 gets electrons from hydrogen, two of them, and it can pass them now to this formula group to become a methylene group. Remember, methylene group has how many bonds between the carbon? Exactly. Now, that methylene group is going to be further reduced into a methyl group which has only one double bond, one, excuse me, bond, and three hydrogens. 
So you have gone from a formyl to a methylene, from a methylene to a methyl. And again, the coenzyme F420 does that reduction, and the electrons come from the utilization of hydrogen. This is where the hydrogen is being used that is being generated through the fermentation process. Now here, we're going to have the exchange. The methanopterane with the methyl group, it's going to be transferred by the methyl transferase from the methanopterane to the coenzyme M through this thiol group that is here. So you can see that now you get the coenzyme thiol methyl group. Eventually, that is going to be reduced one more time by the methyl reductase S420 complex. So now that methyl group gets released as methane. To remove that coenzyme M with the thiol group, you need to have the coenzyme B with a thiol group. And remember, just like in cysteine, the, hydro the cysteine cysteine bond, you're going to create a coenzyme N sulfur sulfur bond to coenzyme B. And that eventually gets oxidized by the ferrodoxin group over here, recycling again now the, the ferrodoxin as well as recycling the coenzyme M. Very different amount of respiration that you're getting. This produces, a, in this case, this produces a sodium motile force, this is B producing sodium, and that is now able to use ATP. It's not a proton motile force, it is a sodium motile force, and it uses a sodium dependent ATP synthase. Not the same one that we have seen, which is a proton dependent ATP synthase. This is a sodium one. All right? So now, perfect timing. What I want you to take a look are these different little reactions here which are looking at the respiratory reactions which are happening simultaneously to get you multiple units. So here, of course, you get oxygen reduction, no, normal typical respiration. But in the absence of oxygen, you're going to have those anaerobic respiration happening, creating some other little molecules that those could be used by respiration by other cells. So take a look. Here I give you nitrate reduction, manganese reduction, we didn't talk a lot about it, iron reduction, you're going to read about it in the book. Here is sulfate reduction and here is methane reduction. Look at the um, electron, um, look at the rate of potential of that reaction. Here in this particular, because I was using millivolts at the time, it still expressed in millivolts. Think about it and calculate it. Assume that NADH is the donor with that particular millivolt, plug it into the equation and you can see the amount of energy generated. And with that, I'll stop the lecture.